Good morning. Good morning, um, or afternoon, or evening, wherever wherever you are joining us from. Um, my name is Julie Perkins. I'm the OIC for GWAPA, the UN um, Habitat-led network that's facilitating uh, learning and care support between utilities. And this is um, our next installment of our uh, GWAPA um, Utilities Fight COVID webinar series. Um, that's focusing on utilities responses to the COVID crisis. Today we're going to look more closely at the emergency responses of utilities, focusing in on cases from Colombia, Italy, South Africa, Palestine, and uh, the Philippines. We're very happy to have um, to be able to put on these webinars uh, uh, to facilitate this sharing between utilities, which we're finding is even more important during this uh, COVID crisis. Um, and it's thanks to the collaboration that we have with our many partners that we're able to do this. Um, in particular, today's webinar we're, we're co-organizing with uh, Aqua Publica Europea. And we have the amazing lineup of utility experts that we have been able to identify with the help of our various regional um, WAP platforms um, listed on the, on the screen, um, as well as other key substantive partners like GIZ and our, our main donor uh, BMZ in Germany. Um, before we get started, just a few points about um, housekeeping and the webinar, uh, the, the Zoom program, if you're not that familiar with it. Um, for everyone down at the bottom of your screen, there is a, a, an interpretation, a globe, that will allow you to have um, an interpretation into French or Spanish. If you are an English speaker, it's also good to select English um, so that you can have interpretation from Spanish. We will have a speaker who will be speaking Spanish. Um, throughout the webinar, you're invited to introduce questions into the question and answer box at the bottom of the screen, a Q&A. Um, you can, there you can introduce questions and you can also upvote questions. So if there's someone else has asked a question that you like and would like answered, then you can um, raise your thumb and indicate that you want that question answered. Um, and there's also a chat box in case you're having any technical problems or any other kinds of issues. We're also going to be providing links in that chat box. Um, so please, uh, please, please use it if you need it. We'll also be doing some interactive polling. Now this will come up um, as we do it, but if you would like right now, you can prepare um, by opening your browser to menti.com and entering the code 553009. And we've already opened with the first um, polling question, so you're welcome to respond to this now. But other questions will be will be brought up um, as we as we go along. Um, any any uh, any questions that are not answered in the question and answer, um, we will be sharing more on this at the end of the webinar. But we have a, a, a workplace platform that is active where we're encouraging uh, webinar participants as well as our panelists to go on after this webinar and to be able to carry on the conversation there, um, to post documents, to share things. Um, it's a, kind of a, a, a continuation of this discussion. So just for an overview of what we're going to go through today, um, I'm your host. Um, I will just be speaking at the beginning and the end, and then we'll be led through the discussion by our moderator, Anne Bousquet, um, who is my colleague at, at GWAPA UN Habitat. Um, and she will be moderating, we'll have a discussion, an introduction first by Milo Fiasconaro from APE. And then Anne will moderate a discussion between the operators from the different countries that she will introduce um, just after this. As a quick introduction to this, to this seminar, um, the topic that we're looking at today, um, you know, many activities uh, have been shut down due to this pandemic. Many of you are still probably in confinement and not able to um, work as usual, but of course this is not the case with water and sanitation service providers. To the contrary, um, services must continue um, flow, to flow people's taps as a matter of public health. And water and sanitation operators have had to carry on this daily work while adapting rapidly to ensure both the continuity of essential services for all and the safety and health of those workers um, that are on the front lines. And these efforts have required both immediate organizational and operational measures um, from the setup of crisis units, development of emergency strategies, and just a constant adaptation to this ever evolving situation. Um, this webinar today is going to look at these emergency responses that have um, that have happened on five five continents with a special sort of focus also at the beginning from Milo on the European context. And with no further ado, let me now introduce um, our special 
uh, partner uh, in this in this particular webinar, the executive director of um, Aqua Publica Europea, Mr. Milo Fiasconaro, who's joining us from Brussels. Welcome, Milo. Hello, hello, everyone. Thanks, thanks a lot, Julie, for this. Uh, uh, introduction. Um, I think I'm going as discussed to share my screen soon. Um, I'm doing it now. Uh, when uh, Craig is giving me the permission, because apparently I have not yet the permission uh, to share my screen. But in the meantime, uh, thanks a lot, Julie, and thanks, Giwopa, <clears throat> for inviting us, for proposing actually uh, this joint uh, webinar, a proposal that we were really happy to accept, uh, also in the light of what we I'm going to present in a minute. Um, I try again with the screen sharing, which now ah, oh, works so many uh, screens I can share. Well, voilà, this one is, should be the right one. I'm going, so now you should be able to see my screen. Um, so as uh, Julie was saying, um, uh, well, for, first, what is Aqua Publica? Aqua Publica is a network at the European level of publicly owned water utilities. Overall, we bring together 65 uh, members, uh, ranging from uh, small uh, utilities in more rural areas to big uh, operators like uh, operator from Paris, from Brussels, from Ireland, and also the operator from uh, Turin, Italy. And I'm very happy that we have today also Armando Quazzo from, uh, from SMAT, the water operator from, from uh, Turin, with, one, with, with which we collaborated during these days uh, to prepare what I'm going to present in a second. So uh, Armando, please feel, don't hesitate to correct me or integrate what I'm saying during the presentation. Um, Aqua Publica Europea, uh, what, what we do Aqua Publica Europea are essentially two things. One is advocacy uh, to promote public water management at the European level. And then we are a platform, a regional platform, let's say European level, where, where we try to facilitate uh, exchange uh, and collaboration among public uh, water utilities at European level. We do it in different ways from more classical one, like uh, organizing seminar, uh, and specific events on uh, issue of common interest to uh, our own initiatives like uh, Water, Eras Water Erasmus one, where we try to promote staff exchange, uh, study visit among water utilities. And it's also within this framework, with this, within this uh, activity as a platform that we, we work, uh, we have been working the last two, three months uh, on the COVID-19 uh, emergency. Before, Illustrating uh, um, what we have been doing over the last three months, uh, I think it's it's worth briefly recalling uh, the chronology of the outbreak of COVID-19 in Europe. Uh, what is important to note, I think, is that uh, between the first cases, autochthonous cases, let's say, of COVID-19 in Europe at the end of February in Italy, and the widespread adoption of lockdown measures across most of European countries, there are overall three weeks. Uh, first case is in Italy, uh, uh, end of February, uh, closing of the borders, a lockdown measure, mid-March. Uh, so it's relatively a short period. Uh, and it's also important to, 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 to add that uh, while uh, especially Italy at first was facing a severe uh, outbreak of, of uh, COVID-19, uh, in the rest of Europe, for many days, uh, let's say that life went on a bit uh, like as usual with important public events taking place until the very end, I mean, until the very moment where uh, then lockdown measures were adopted. This is important to say because uh, lockdown measures were adopted really in a matter of some days, uh, some, sometime, some, uh, sometime it's in a matter of hours. In a, in a context of buy uncertainty about what to do, also, we are in Europe, within the European Union, we must say also at the beginning, a lack of coordination of, uh, of uh, the European institution. Um, so in this period, operators, water operators had to endure a very high pressure because they need to act very quickly uh, and to adopt contingency plan and above all, to ensure continuity of the service uh, while minimizing risk and in the context, as I was saying, of 
high uncertainty, significant disruption, limitation to mobility, uh, and also a bit of confusion, let, 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 let's be honest about what needed to be done. So a period of intense uh, stress, intense um, uh, pressure on water operators, and it's precisely in this context that there was, there was a strong need uh, from uh, European water operators to exchange with, that, which, which, with each other in this period, um, to exchange uh, about what needed to be done, what was going on, especially uh, talking with utilities in the areas that were first affected by the outbreak, uh, Italy and Spain, to learn what was going on in that continent, this uh, new unprecedented uh, situation. So, what we have been do doing as Aqua Public in this period was, well, first of all, to try to facilitate uh, dialogue and exchange among uh, uh, water utilities. Uh, we, are, we organized three video conferences on the response to COVID-19 on three different, slightly different uh, topics uh, with the high participation of our members that were, of course, interested to, to share experiences and to explore together common, common challenges. We have also created a, a library. We have been collected uh, uh, resources from utilities and contingency plan examples, but also external useful information, for example, from the WHO and other institutions. And we also have been, have been helping utilities in, re, in communication efforts to ensure citizens, for example, about uh, the safety of tap water during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic, but also, you know, um, giving visibility to the commitment of uh, employees uh, during this, uh, this period. Um, and now that we are a bit slowly, slowly moving out from the emergency mode, let's say, we have decided uh, in collaboration indeed with, with Europa uh, that maybe it was useful uh, to take a bit stock of, of, of these months uh, by doing what? Well, we just, by collecting a bit, we, by summarizing the wealth of information and experiences that we, uh, operators have, have been sharing uh, during, during these months. Uh, and we have been working uh, and preparing um, uh, um, uh, a, publica a publication uh, where we try to report some of the good practices, some of the examples coming from, from utilities across Europe, but also to try to draw some lessons uh, from what was, especially from what was not expected. I mean, from problems that we were not prepared to face uh, in order, of course, to be better prepared for the, for the future. Um, I will not go in, uh, into detail of this uh, publication, which, by the way, is still a, a draft, and we have been doing, uh, uh, and we will be finalized in the coming days to, together with, in partnership with Europa. Uh, but what I want to, um, to stress is that uh, it, this, this, this publication is not a handbook, is not, uh, our ambition is not to, to teach or prescribe anything to anyone. It's really an account, an account of what operators have been experiencing, experiencing in this month. And you, you want to do uh, an, a tool for a dialogue, a dialogue, a dialogue with other utilities from all over the world, uh, which might have different experiences, we may, might have different um, best practices to, to, to share, and in order all together in the framework of GWOPA uh, to move together uh, on, the, on, the on the lesson learned. So uh, I will not bother you now with the content of the publication that will be released soon and will, you get informed when this will be out. Uh, but in view in, in particular of the discussion coming up now in the, in the panel, uh, there are a couple of elements that maybe uh, is worth uh, highlighting, especially indeed as an input to the forthcoming discussion. Um, there are three, four elements uh, that it seems that very, really important uh, in managing the emergency, the emergency period, the crisis, uh, the crisis period. Uh, first, uh, of course, operators that had already in place uh, risk management approaches uh, were able to adapt more quickly, more swiftly to the new situation, where uh, we're more quick to adapt contingency plan and to shift from, uh, let's say, business as usual model to an emergency model. Um, uh, and within uh, this framework, within the importance of risk management, particularly relevant appear to be the fact of having procedures 
to collect uh, and process a, a, a huge amount of information. The point it was not having data, the point was not having uh, information, the point was make sense of them. Uh, to, to make sense of them, to process them, to, in order to take decisions quickly, and also to, to, to report information to those who need information, employees first, uh, manager then, but also external authority. Of course, in this framework, in this specific crisis, what also appeared as, a, as crucial was the IT infrastructure. Um, in the, in the uh, urgent shift from, uh, to, to, in a lockdown situation to remote working, the uh, IT infrastructure, of course, uh, played a, a key role and also pose key challenges for many operators. Let's, let's be honest on, on that. And, and finally, stocks. I mean, uh, not only um, protection equipment, uh, which was a huge issue in Europe across all countries and across all sectors, but also critical supplies for water operator. And at the, at the moment in Europe, there was really a concern uh, also due to the closure uh, of the borders about uh, uh, sourcing uh, essential supplies, for example, uh, um, chemicals for, um, for treating water or for, or for ma um, monitoring the quality of water. Uh, if this is what appear as, 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 uh, was, as a particularly important during the emergency time, um, then looking forward, uh, I think it's also interesting now to start thinking uh, what will remain out of this uh, period? I mean, what, what will be the impact uh, of the pandemic on water operator uh, organization? Uh, as usual, a, a crisis comes with both uh, challenges and opportunity. Uh, it's, this is a way of saying, of course, but it's true that when we are talking out with, uh, with utilities, many are also pointing out to some good implications, to some some good lessons that have been learned or improvements that have been done out of the, uh, the emergency period. For example, many operators have been pointing out that the, the quality of the relationship between uh, uh, operators and users has been improving actually. Uh, because, uh, for example, users were required to, perf to perform themselves some operation like uh, reading the meters or some basic fixing uh, while being guided to do so from remote from the operator because it was not impossible for operators employee to, to, to reach the house, to enter the house. And this, for example, was found to, to help creating new bondings between operators and users. Also, um, uh, through this, some operators have learned that cooperation between some departments are particularly important, and in particular between the uh, cooperation between the customer, customer relation, customer care department and the technical department, more dialogue is important indeed as a result of this new way of, of operating. Uh, of course, uh, all of this was uh, possible to, through um, uh, to digital tools, but now operators are also wondering how to close the gap with these categories of users that for whatever reason uh, they suffer from a, a digital gap. Uh, again, uh, management, uh, risk management, uh, that will prove again important, but it's not only a matter of having, as many operators are pointing out, having good plans written on paper, but it's a matter of inscribing it in a really the operation, the, the daily operation of, uh, uh, of the operator and having the involvement of the employees on this. Um, because this is a new way of operating that cross uh, the cut across uh, the huge, usual uh, hierarchical and vertical function of the operators. And finally, uh, the economic impact. Of course, there are huge concerns also in Europe of what will be the economic impact uh, of this crisis. This is, uh, there is no hidden, I mean, there's no way, no way we can uh, downplay this risk. At the same time, this is also pushing maybe to rethink uh, traditional finance system, system of water utilities. Uh, beyond the transfer and tariff. And on this, I can mention some cooperation that we are also doing with the OECD and then where we get a discussion to explore new approaches to, uh, to water operator financing. I stop here. Uh, once again, thank to Europa for inviting us and for organizing uh, this um, uh, webinar. Uh, and again, uh, all of this will be uh, summarized in, a, in this joint publication that you will 
be seen soon. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Milo. So while we are rearranging the screen, I'm going to introduce myself. I'm Anne Bousquet, I'm with GWOPA and I will be moderating the, the discussion today. So let's have a look at the results uh, that we had uh, for the first question, which, which was the biggest challenge for utility, utility operations as a result of COVID-19. So you see that the first uh, three main challenges uh, mentioned by the audience is about staff management. And I think we will hear more about that in the, in the example coming. The second uh, challenge, and uh, it's also a, a big one, as Milo also mentioned, is the liquidity and, and the cash flow. Uh, what are going to be the, the, the financial consequences for the, for the utilities? And securing essential supplies, um, we will have some examples about this also in the, in the coming uh, presentations. Uh, we will have another question also uh, on the Mentimeter. So don't forget to, to go on uh, menti.com and use the code. Uh, we have a second question, which is about uh, the support needed by the utilities to prepare for emergency like, like COVID. So please respond to this question in, uh, in the Mentimeter. So now I would like to go to the panelists and start introducing them. Uh, I will introduce them one uh, after the other and they will respond to the question about the challenges that they have uh, been facing with their utilities in terms of crisis management, the measures that have been taken and also um, uh, the, the relationship with the different types of authorities, uh, local governments, uh, health authorities, they will tell us about that. Uh, so I would like uh, to go to our first uh, distinguished panelist, um, Mrs. Christina Arango Olaya. Uh, she's going to talk in English, so please, for those who, in Spanish, so for those who can't understand Spanish, please uh, go to the interpretation and select the English uh, channel. So Mrs. Uh, Christina Arango Olaya is the managing director for the water and sanitation operator from Bogota, uh, Colombia. Um, our company um, serves the city of Bogota, but also uh, nine other uh, municipalities around. They have around uh, almost nine million uh, direct users. So it's a really big company. Uh, it's a, it's an peri it's, it's a, an area with uh, various uh, socioeconomic background with also some uh, informal settlements and um, the ratio of water coverage is, is uh, quite uh, very is quite high almost uh, universal coverage with 90-90 uh, uh, percent uh, same for sanitation which is also remarkable 98 percent and the uh, number of uh, connection that they are managing is above 2 million and 300,000. Uh, they are also uh, running the, so the, the operation with a total of 3,187 uh, employees. So um, now coming to the situation for COVID-19, uh, COVID uh, the city as well as the country has been hit hard with a high number of people contaminated uh, in Bogota, only 225 people have, been, uh, have died from the, from the disease and uh, only uh, a few employees were um, affected, but affected outside their working uh, space, actually. So now, Christina, uh, if you are ready, please uh, uh, take the floor. Eh, bueno, muy buenas tardes. Un saludo a toda la audiencia y un gusto poder estar aquí con todos ustedes para compartir la experiencia desde Colombia y específicamente desde Bogotá. Eh, desde la empresa yo creo que hemos tra tratado de manejar la crisis como en tres fre grandes frentes. Eh, el primero que ha sido como el más difícil de enfrentar es como una nueva forma de operar la empresa a la cual no estábamos acostumbrados y, y de un día a otro, digamos, la situación cambia y nos toca asumir unas nuevas formas de eh, ejercer la operación en dos, en dos grandes sentidos. El primero, 
eh, eh, implementar el teletrabajo para que todas las personas administrativas eh, y las que en general pudieran hacerlo eh, estén desde sus casas eh, trabajando eh, con acuerdos de trabajo para lograr los objetivos de la empresa. Y lo segundo, eh, los que están en la calle eh, trabajando y en general operando plantas o resolviendo daños en general en la operación, eh, lo pudieran hacer de la manera más protegida y con todas las medidas de bioseguridad posibles. Eh, lo cual nos implicó generar protocolos de bioseguridad, eh, eh, que todas las personas estuvieran al tanto de cómo hacerlo, eh, capacitaciones eh, y trabajar en conjunto para lograr eh, proteger a nuestros empleados. Eh, también hemos tratado de hacer eh, pues reuniones diarias con los directivos para tratar de solucionar todos los problemas de la operación, garantizando la calidad del agua y eh, pues posibles daños que tener, eh, eh, situaciones que tenemos en el día a día para solucionarlas lo más rápido posible. Y una estrategia de comunicación interna muy fuerte para nuestros empleados, para que todos entiendan eh, qué estamos haciendo, cuál es la situación y cuál es el papel de cada uno eh, para lograr salir adelante. Otro frente que hemos atacado también es el de los usuarios y esto ha sido en conjunto con el gobierno nacional y con el gobierno local. Eh, lo primero es que se suspendían los cortes programados, eh, que ya volvimos a reiniciar eh, con nuevas medidas de seguridad. Se reconectaron los usuarios que teníamos suspendidos por falta de pago de acuerdo a las instrucciones del gobierno nacional eh, para que durante el confinamiento todos tuvieran acceso, digamos, al servicio del agua. Y adicionalmente apoyamos técnicamente eh, para un subsidio adicional por parte de la alcaldía para que eh, durante la cuarentena las personas tuvieran eh, 1.4 metros, los usuarios tuvieran 1.4 metros cúbicos subsidiados por parte del distrito, que es más o menos equivalente a la proyección del incremento en el consumo eh, durante momentos de confinamiento. Y de esta manera, eh, pues tratar de que el impacto sobre las facturas no fuera tan grande. Eh, y finalmente, un trabajo en términos de administración financiera y proteger la caja de la empresa en este momento que consiste en tener los recursos a la vista, básicamente, y eh, reprogramación de inversiones eh, mientras tenemos más certidumbre sobre lo que va a pasar. Y con eso digamos que terminaría. Uh, thank you, Cristina. I think we will have uh, more questions for you uh, later on. Uh, before, um, okay, so we have uh, the, the result of, um, of, uh, of the poll already, uh, which was the, the question was about um, the capacity. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, no, that's sorry. That's a question that is now uh, on the available on the poll about the, the capacity, the, the capacity development needs or other types of uh, of uh, support that the utilities are needed to prepare for an emergency like, like uh, COVID. So again, this is available on um, on menti.com, and um, and the the result uh, we had was that. Capacity development uh, was really one of the first uh, priorities for the utilities to get prepared. The financial aspects, again, like uh, have increased subsidies, as Christina said, for example, uh, uh, no disconnection, reconnection, uh, making sure that people can afford water. So that's also has some, uh, some uh, consequences on the finance and uh, closer collaboration with uh, authorities. So now I would like to, to go to the second panelist, uh, and I would like to have uh, Mr. Akram Nassar from Bethlehem. Hello again, how are you guys? Uh, thanks for uh, giving me the chance to talk about the situation here in Bethlehem. Uh, maybe there is so many missings in the out face of this page. 
So uh, um, I will, uh, because I already sent them, but it seems we have a problem in transferring some information. Thanks for the photos. Uh, frankly speaking, uh, I'm Akram Nassar, the general director of the Water Authority uh, in Bethlehem. Um, we are considered as a local uh, utility with um, giving service for 120,000 inhabitants only. Uh, um, we covering with the water uh, service 95% and uh, covering the percentage of the uh, wastewater it's only 70% so we were looking for to have extra projects to extend the network to uh, 30 other 30%. Our uh, subscribers is 15,000 only. Uh, we have 96 employees, so we consider as a mid-range uh, organization. Uh, during the uh, situation of uh, uh, in pandemic um, uh, COVID-19, um, I would like to comment that, uh, as you know, that uh, Bethlehem, it's a small area, but in the same time, we have a lot of uh, tourists coming for uh, visiting the Holy Land. So um, the first time we got the information of uh, the progression of this uh, pandemic virus uh, was uh, on the um, end of uh, February. Uh, but it, it was from a Korean uh, group, but this is not our case talking about which, which part but uh, due to the transfer of the Holy Land, because it's not considered only Palestine, Israel, and uh, Jordan, also there is uh, Egypt, Lebanon, and Syria. So the first uh, was uh, the first time of uh, having the virus being uh, spread. It was in March 5th. So the lockdown from our uh, governorate being on Bethlehem to be as a closed area. Uh, and to be locked down on uh, March 5th. Now, um, as you know, uh, the procedure that been taken through our uh, responsibilities, people here in uh, the government, um, they didn't allow anybody to go out of Bethlehem or to get in Bethlehem. And there was uh, too much restriction to, to cut out um, the transfer of this uh, virus so um, this is continued till May 24th. So we, we stayed like uh, two months and a half um, lockdown. So a number of uh, viruses that uh, reported, it was 53 in Bethlehem and 613 in Palestine in general. Um, we didn't uh, report any death in Bethlehem, uh, but in Palestine there was three deaths. deaths. Uh, about the, uh, in, in my utility, we don't have any case, thanks be to God, uh, of uh, losing anybody. Uh, so um, the procedure that we've been in, it was in the beginning of March. And we tried to, to, to know exactly what to do. Uh, we don't have that potential to understand, especially uh, about viruses and how they are uh, transferred from to uh, so I started as uh, general management to read through WHO and CDC to, to know exactly how uh, the transmission of the COVID-19 uh, can be done, especially uh, that I experienced with uh, my team, the problem of uh, in, in the water pumps and wastewater pumps as uh, we had a sudden uh, impact or, uh, because you know the number of uh, people who are using the water and uh, the discharging wastewater it's increased and suddenly we have like a, a peak uh, and we could uh, the, the system uh, it was uh, uh, structured and designed to be with the peak but there is some problems happen we try to to manage to understand how to stop the transmission and we found out that uh, when we are talk about uh, the COVID-19, uh, the coronavirus, it is the same or look like the SARS. So this can be transferred by the wastewater and in the same time in water. But so I need to, to look for 
the procedure, how to stop it. Um, I managed to know that through a uh, benzyl chlorium chloride, um, with some uh, percentage of concentration, uh, you can use it in the main uh, pumping station for water supply. So this kind of uh, chlorination system will stop the, uh, the, uh, the pro pro propagation of the virus or the transmission of the virus. And so we had the problem about how to solve the trans uh, transferring of this virus in the wastewater. As you know, Bethlehem doesn't have any treatment to plan till this moment. So all our uh, wastewater, the effluent is discharged into the valley directly without a treatment. So it will be more dangerous if we consider that the pandemic COVID-19 will be transferred. So uh, we gave the health ministry in Bethlehem a procedure how uh, to, to manage to put some chlorine, uh, approximately like 150 milli uh, into uh, the discharge of the waste, especially for those who are experiencing the lockdown or who have been infected by the virus. Uh, at the same time, we've been arranging through uh, our civil defense because and not allowed anyone to get in and we don't have, the market was uh, even, it's not uh, prepared for the pencil corium or uh, disinfection uh, materials. Um, and also uh, when we are using also the personal uh, equipment, it won't be uh, possible to continue for a long time. So we need to to have a new system, a new PPEs, uh, gloves, or other things. So uh, we managed to, through the civil defense to have the chlorine uh, or the benzyl chlorine chloride to be spread into the facilities in wastewater. And in the same time, we've been um, uh, uh, making uh, disinfection for the offices for the emergencies. Uh, in this way, uh, we, I think we have to evaluate, especially the risk management, uh, updating of the methodology, especially that is a new thing. We need to uh, improve uh, the confusion that happens, especially because it's a new thing. Uh, we also need to, uh, to have uh, financial uh, resources, especially all the banks were being closed. And so the, to have in the beginning of the, of the month, uh, the financial resources, it, it was a little bit difficult. So um, I, I think we have to, talk, to look as water utilities, not only from my side, from different sides, to, to tackle this issue, uh, especially through GWOPA in one of the uh, debates or discussion uh, to manage, to have the experience shared as knowledge management uh, with health and uh, utilities for water and wastewater. Thank you for listening. I'm sorry for doing that. Uh, no, no problem. I think there, there will be also some questions for you, but uh, let's, uh, let's go now to our next uh, panelist, uh, who is Mr. Leonardo Vasquez from uh, Zamboanga City uh, from the Philippines. I'm just waiting to have uh, the slide for uh, introducing Mr. Vasquez. So Mr. Vasquez is the, the general manager from Tamboanga City Water District. Uh, it, it is a local uh, operator uh, for quite a big city with uh, around 1 million inhabitants, uh, with 20 to 30% of people living in informal settlement. The, the coverage ratio for water is quite low. Maybe Leonardo can also explain a bit about that, 37%. And for sanitation, even lower with 2%. Number of connections managed by the company, six, uh, 63,000, with uh, 353 workers and also some services outsourced. Uh, the situation for the COVID-19 is slowly increasing. It has started... Uh, in the prison, apparently, which was the, the epicenter. Uh, luckily, a uh, number of employees affected none, but as you can see, uh, some, uh, uh, some cases reported and also, unfortunately, some death. So I will ask uh, Mr. Vasquez now to, to, to talk about uh, the measures 
uh, his company has taken to for crisis management. Please, Mr. Vasquez, floor is yours. Yes, sir. Thank you for having me. Uh, the Samuanga City Water District is a government-owned and controlled corporation who have been in existence for the past 46 years. We provide water shed service. Uh, we protect and uh, we maintain. We also have a very small sewer system and we do treatment of water and distribution. Since January of 2019, we are under rationing because of, I think, climate change. The rivers have really gone down to as low as 50-40%. As of March 6, there was uh, two reported COVID cases in the Philippines. By March 20, our city, Samuanga, was already declared uh, as ECQ or enhanced under lockdown. Our immediate response was really to support a local government. Stay at home, work from home. Uh, you know, we have limited hospitals and uh, we had to protect each other from the virus. Except, of course, for our staff operating our treatment facilities, the treatment plants, production wells, and the repair crews. They were uh, directed to report 24 7. We, however, have a financial ch uh, finance challenge on this because. As I've mentioned, we have been uh, under rationing since January of 2019, so we're carrying losses. Also, our tariff increase was way back 2015. Uh, for the first 10 cubic meters of water, we're only charging $3.60 US. And uh, because of the lockdown, we had no collections. Already, non-renewal of contracts for agency workers and guards started this month. More than 100 will be displaced this year. Since last year, including this year, the total non-renewal of contracts will be about 180 to 200 workers, and we are asking for our government's help. On a daily operation, yes, we had to install plastic uh, protections and barriers in our offices, mainly to protect our employees. We also had to provide PPEs, alcohols, temperature checks, and do a quick info updates on our employees regarding safety measures. There are now several webinars regarding safety protocols and employees are encouraged to attend. To maintain social distancing, waiting sheds were set up outside of our collection centers, but our guards also made sure that social distancing were instituted. Spray of alcohols on the hands, temperature checks, and no mask, no entry policies were enforced. Regarding the documents flows, communication, decision-making, we had to use emails for vouchers approval, memoranda, communication, and teleconferencing for our meetings. We also resorted to average billing fighting for the month of March, April, and May. I ah, know, March and April. Regarding customers' information, we communicated with them through the use of social media, Facebook, Viber, Test Plus, Radio, TV, and posters. As far as our relationship with the, our local government unit, we are always very supportive to our government and uh, we coordinate with them, especially on the cleaning, buy through water tankers of the markets, uh, putting in hand wash stations, and also the delivery of water to hospitals and city chains. Materials and supplies challenge. We are having difficulties in sourcing out materials for leak repairs because we have limited transportation. The boats, shipments for Manila, take, it will take time. So right now we are resorting to other use, like the use of rubber just to tie uh, the, the leaks. And of course, we have to go back to that. Process scenario. Our city is now on GCQ. Personally, I still believe we should still be on the enhanced community quarantine. However, our city and our country must start to recover economically. Because if not, people, especially those who are now out of work, will become a social problem. Hunger, no matter the values, love of country, or character of a person, will drive him to look for means to feed his family. But then again, maybe this COVID-19 is here to stay, just like the flu. Maybe this is the new normal. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vasquez. We, we will come back to this conclusion in the second round of interventions. 
Um, so I, I have uh, now to give the floor to Mr. Uh, Amanf Kassan. Uh, please, can I have uh, his uh, introductory slide? All right, thank you. So Professor Amanf Kastan is uh, the general manager of uh, scientific services division of Randwater, South Africa, province of Johannesburg, and he's also the chair of the COVID-19 task team at Randwater, and uh, he happens to be also the vice president of the African Water Association uh, amongst other uh, tasks. So Randwater is the bulk water supplier for Johannesburg, over three provinces. Uh, the total uh, service area uh, is about 16 million inhabitants, but again, it's about bulk supplying. Uh, in the area, 20% of people living in informal settlements. The coverage ratio for water is quite high, 90%. Uh, so, groundwater provides bulk water to 17 municipalities and manages uh, 3,000 workers. Uh, as you can see, the COVID-19 situation is, uh, is, is still growing uh, in South Africa. The number of reported cases uh, in the country in total is above 24,000 uh, with more than 500 uh, deaths. Uh, in, in, in the utility itself, four employees have been affected. And uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, Groundwater has been established as the national command for water for the whole country. So please, Amanth, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Thank you very much, Anne. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Really delighted to be here. I shall try in uh, five minutes to, to give you a picture of what has been happening in South Africa and in rainwater in particular. Uh, you, the numbers that you showed were about 24, 25,000. Well, the statistic today, which is just a couple of days uh, since I sent you that number, is now 34,357 positive cases. So it's almost 10,000 more. And the number of deaths are now on 705. So clearly we are increasing and uh, we are expecting that because we have been in lockdown for about eight weeks. The lockdown is slowly being eased in that certain sectors of the economy are now being opened, which were closed. We have had four cases in rainwater, as I've indicated there. And uh, at the same time, uh, whilst we are dealing with the COVID problem for rainwater to ensure sustainability of water supply to our 16 million consumers, we also have been uh, mandated by the minister to, to run uh, the National Command Center in supplying water to, um, to, to every other province in this country via 10,000 tanks and about over 1,000 tankers. In addition, we're now busy with a second project which is looking at mobilizing water supply via tankers and tanks to 3,500 schools nationally. But for now, let me focus on how we approach the COVID challenge, the pandemic, which was a surprise to all of us in rainwater, and, and what steps and what approaches we've tried to use to, to continue to do three things, which is our core business, and that is to supply water 24 hours a day, to supply it at a decent price, and to ensure that it is uh, as subscribed to the World Health Organization guideline in terms of water quality. So we early identified two key challenges. The first challenge was how to keep our operations uh, sustainable. And the second challenge was how to protect our staff. On the first challenge, it was very clear up front that the virus is not waterborne. We had for many, many years been preparing for waterborne viruses. That's the nature of a water utility. You need to ensure that you have preparations in place. However, this time around, we don't have a waterborne virus, but we have a virus that requires water for washing of hands every day for people. So the good news was it wasn't waterborne. The bad news is it is airborne, which is actually in some respects worse than waterborne. Now, how do we manage this, this situation? The operations we knew we could, we could manage by ensuring that we do sufficient chlorination, that we tighten up our operational procedures because the virus is not waterborne. Of course, your challenges, which were articulated by the first speaker, were, were all considered in terms of a risk mitigation strategy. How do we ensure that we have supplies, we have chemicals, 
we have key uh, consumables, critical spares, laboratories had to continue to run to test the water, etc. All of this, we put plans in place to try and mitigate. It is easier said than done now, about two months later than when we started, you can imagine. At the time, you know, and some people talk about separating the noise from the signal because there's a lot of panic and, you know, it is quite chaotic, so we need to remain very focused. But more importantly, the big issue was how do we secure employee well-being? Now, of course, I think the experiences that other speakers have brought forward is you need PPE, you need masks, you need sanitizers. These materials are not easily available even in an emergency situation. Understanding that you can bypass procurement procedures because it's an emergency, you cannot always get your hands on these materials as fast as you want them. You try to do the best you can. You need to disinfect your premises, especially after you have cases. This is very important. These are not things we had done before as regularly as we should have been doing. Um, then to do screening of staff and to get thermometers. It, it's, it's sometimes challenging to believe that you know, thermometers are in short supply and you need to pay a premium price in order to get these materials so that we can screen our staff daily via thermometers. And then you need to have isolation procedures, protocols for how you manage cases. Um, we set up a joint operations committee, of course, on day one, we set up a COVID-19 task group with all of our experts present. We have these meetings on a weekly basis. We go through a list of where we are, what is the progress, how many cases do we have, how have we handled them. I can say to you that the four cases that we've had, fortunately, each of the four staff members were infected by people that do not work for our enterprise. Um, and the good news was that we tested up to about 50 people in terms of contact tracing, et cetera. None of these people, other than the four people, were found to be positive. The four that were found to be positive, of course, they were put in quarantine for two weeks. And uh, they then turned to negative within the two weeks. And the great news is that none of them so showed any COVID-related symptoms. So we've had zero deaths. We haven't had people becoming sick, so to say. And we think that we have been managing this in a way, of course, learning from case to case how you do it better and more expediently, et cetera. So essentially, that, that those are some of the steps we put in place. I'd like to talk very briefly to the financial element because I saw a question there. Yes, some of our municipal customers that are not able to pay, there's a directive from government that we should not be punitive towards them because water is necessary for the virus. Liquidity and cash flow, yes, had to be looked at again. However, when you have a lockdown, you cannot have contractors at your premises doing work, et cetera. So in some ways you can't spend some of the money you were supposed to spend. In other ways, you need to spend more because you need all of this PPE and equipment and all of this protective stuff, which you never budgeted for. So we had to remobilize the resources around there. And um, essentially on balance, you know, we think that, that as a team, we've learned a lot, we're progressing well, we do good communications with our customers. Of course, there's regulations every day, different regulations, different rules, you need to stay up to speed with that, you need to comply with that in terms of government policy and keep you know, all of your housekeeping done. Um, you know, I'm tempted to talk to the long-term consequences and implications very quickly. And to that, you know, I would say that technology certainly is an enabler because we had to get all of 70% of our staff working from home. We needed laptops, we needed their ability to be able to tune in to our network, cybersecurity is an, issue, is an issue you need to consider very seriously when you mobilize all of these people at home. So innovation comes with unintended consequences, which we need to be very cautious about. You may solve one problem, you may create a different problem. So technology is great when you use it. And you know, in hindsight, we should have been using this long ago. It was all available, right? It's just that I think, you know, in the water utilities, we've been a little more cautious and we've been a little slow at adopting it, but everybody loves it now. Like we're doing Zoom now and we're talking, we don't even have to fly around the world. Of course, it's not as exciting as flying around the world, but we still communicate and we still get the work done. You know, I read an interesting article recently which talked about supply chain management and it talked in particular about from just in time, to just in time and just in case supply chains. 
So this whole notion of just in time, you know, we think we can prepare and have everything ready for what we need for now, but we're not ready for a crisis. So perhaps we need to start thinking more conservatively like we used to in the older days. Like what about just in case something happens? So I believe that's one big lesson. The other interesting thing for me in particular has been, you know, we should stop assuming that old ways will come back. Really, we'd love to go back to our old ways. But in, in some instances, those ways are not coming back to us. And finally, what I'd like to say is, we should stop relying on traditional structures because what we've learned is, you know, we, we have designed our organizations to be hierarchical, to have lines and silos and responsibilities for people, etc. But during a crisis, we found that networks and teamwork is how things actually happen for you to move with speed and for you to resolve problems and ensure that you're providing the water and you're keeping your employees safe. So with that, you know, really delighted to be part of this and to be able to share. And I'm sure that, you know, the utilities are indeed learn through the help of GWAPA from each other and we'll become better and we'll become stronger. And we'd like to provide all the water to all of the people who need it in the world. Remember the sustainable development goals. So delighted to be here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Amanf Kassan. A very interesting intervention. There are some questions for you, but we'll go to the question after the second round of intervention. So now I would like to uh, have uh, Armando Quazzo from uh, Turin, Italy, uh, taking the floor. Let me introduce uh, him first. So he's the marketing and uh, development manager at SMAT, which is the local public operator for in Italy. It serves a population uh, of more than of close to 3 million inhabitants, very high coverage of uh, uh, water and uh, same for sanitation, number of connections managed by the company over 400,000 uh, with uh, 955 uh, employees. For the COVID situation, of course, Italy is a special case because uh, it was one of the worst affected countries uh, in Europe, in the world, uh, and Piedmont uh, and uh, Northern Italy, the, also the, one of the worst within Italy uh, affected by the pandemic. Uh, the, the contagion is now decreasing, but uh, everybody's fearing a second wave. Um, so if we look at the figures, uh, you can see two, more than 220,000 people affected by by COVID-19 in Italy, Piedmont alone, more than 30,000. In terms of death, Italy, over 30,000 people. And for Piedmont, again, uh, 3,612. Uh, number of people affected, employee affected within uh, SMAT 3. Uh, and in terms of uh, the situation, so Ita Italy has uh, gone through a lockdown period, which has now in the ended, circulation has been limiting, and I think that now that uh, the, also the quarantine and the, the restriction will, will be done uh, soon. Uh, but I will let uh, Mr. Quadzo uh, talking more about that. Please, the, the floor is yours, Mr. Quadzo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, yes, uh, we are, uh, we come from the, from the worst part. I mean, if you look at Italy, Northwest was the, the area that has been more affected by uh, the virus. And uh, we are not far from uh, Codogno where it was uh, sprouted out uh, uh, the, the, the virus. We are, we are in the red zone and uh, you can tell it from the numbers that uh, you can see. Uh, Professor Kassan uh, said uh, before that they had four cases uh, on 3,000 employees. Uh, we in SMAT uh, had, uh, had uh, three cases in, on 1,000 employees. So uh, let's say that the toll that has been paid uh, has, been, has been quite, quite important. Uh, as you said before, and, uh, SMAT is the public owned uh, uh, company. Uh, we, we serve the service, uh, the integrated water service, so from uh, water to wastewater uh, for uh, about 300 city councils here in the northwest uh, of, of Italy. And uh, we are uh, one of the founders uh, of uh, and members of uh, uh, APE, uh, which has been, uh, the, the association has been proved uh, to be a real, real help during this, uh, this, this, people, uh, this period. 
Um, I, would, I would say that uh, I could su subscribe the 100% of what my colleagues have said before about uh, uh, the, uh, the, the, the breakdown. Um, let's say that, uh, uh, as, uh, as Christina Arango said in the beginning, uh, we, we had to, to, to put out a new way to operate the business, period. It was uh, something totally, totally different and something that uh, we were not used to. Um, let me say that uh, uh, being uh, our companies, 24-7 uh, companies, uh, it, uh, operation has not been the issue because we are used to, to work uh, with reduced amount of uh, personnel during nights or weekends and, and therefore uh, the, essential, the essential operation uh, was abs absolutely, absolutely uh, well, 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 well organized. Uh, however, uh, let's say that uh, one of the other tools that uh, we had, uh, um, that we, we used uh, during this start of the, of the period was uh, uh, the, the WSP, uh, the water safety plans that uh, had uh, a great, uh, great help also into identifying which were the essential areas. Uh, finance has not been yet, let me, let me underline the yet, uh, an issue, but you know, as operators, we have a period of hysteresis quite long. We make the reading uh, of the meters every three or four or six months, and therefore we will feel the, the effect uh, uh, um, in, a, in, a, in a longer time. Um, not uh, that that's not the case of uh, uh, the economy, which is already already uh, showing signs of uh, suffering. Um, one of the parts that has have been uh, impacted more, as has been said before by my colleagues, uh, was IT. Uh, we we had. Uh, I, I think that uh, information technologies has undergone the worst test. Uh, all the clerks, uh, I mean about half the workforce of the company have been put into remote working in a couple of days. So PCs that were not portable have been turned into portable with modems, uh, VPN access uh, and, uh, and everything that was needing. Uh, one, of the, one of the issues that uh, has been uh, uh, faced uh, was uh, uh, safety and security of this connection. And I think that uh, uh, we, are, we are still working hard uh, in order to uh, make sure that uh, um, if the virus doesn't uh, affect uh, our employees also, and uh, an informatic virus must not affect uh, uh, our PCs. So that, that would be, that, that, that is, that is a, um, a really, really uh, important, uh, important item. Uh, staff management, yes, uh, communication towards staff has been uh, crucial and uh, uh, since the beginning of, uh, of the outbreak uh, uh, we studied, I would say in about one week, 10 days, a specific app that couples your portable phone uh, to a beacon. Uh, it's one of those uh, medallions, one of those cards that uh, you, you use into, in, uh, in, uh, in um, museums uh, and as soon as you approach uh, to a certain uh, to a certain painting or a certain statue uh, it will show up on your on your telephone uh, what's uh, uh, what's the, the the author and a lot of information so we use this technology in order to create an app that uh, uh, could uh, read the proximity among workers uh, in the in the offices or in the in the in the building building yards, uh, in order to to trace uh, all the uh, the uh, all the all the workers uh, into into uh, that come in contact. Uh, I mean uh, the the system um, reads uh, the proximity among workers, uh, beeps uh, if they are closer than one meter, and tracks the contacts uh, uh, and time of the contact. Uh, then, should a visitor become positive, we can trace uh, the others with whom uh, the visitor went in contact and inform him about the possibility of a contagion uh, of the virus. Um, another, another issue was the supply management uh, that has not uh, been uh, in fact affected uh, due to uh, good, uh, good stocking and uh, customer management has, uh, has been totally, totally uh, modified. 
uh, shut down all the front offices, ask the customers to use the site and the apps, uh, and only in a few days uh, we have started again all the front offices. Um, a small portion of customers doesn't get used uh, to, to this, but uh, I mean, uh, we, we, we really hope that uh, this virus uh, shall, shall bring some, some kind of uh, change into the, the behavior. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out, you know, we are a regulated company and uh, therefore the contacts with the authority is, uh, is very, very strict. But uh, I was, I was uh, really shocked by one of the uh, members of our regulatory authority when uh, uh, he said that during a conference, uh, we are learning by doing. I mean, we are all in the same condition because we are not doing, um, uh, we are, we are, we're facing something really, really, really different and uh, really unusual for, for everyone, also for the authorities and also for the regulators. Uh, a few words on uh, the lessons learned. Um, uh, first of all, I have to, to point out and uh, uh, happy. Uh, and to just save your, your conclusions and lessons world because that will be the next round of uh, okay. interventions. Okay, uh, uh, the one, one only thing is that uh, uh, the outcome for um, water companies may be completely different. And so we have to work on it. I mean, uh, the outcome uh, on, uh, on um, uh, water uh, um, quantity in Turin is close to zero. Uh, we saw from other members of APE that in Paris has been, uh, had, uh, had taken a decrease of 25% uh, in Seville, in Spain, uh, a decrease uh, from 50 to 90% of decrease of the, of the, of the use. So uh, we really have to watch out the situation and uh, tailor uh, the, and tailor the, the new solutions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a quick reminder for everybody, you can ask a question in the Q&R box um, that is at the bottom of your screen. I know that we have already a few, we'll take them later. Uh, we have also a third question on the poll. That is about, uh, okay, so if COVID-19 has a silver lining for service provider, what is it? So please uh, respond to this and we will look at the results after this round of uh, last question for the, for the panelists. Uh, I just leave it there, menti.com and use the code that you can see here. It's also somewhere in the chat box for you. Uh, all right, so, very diverse uh, situation, as, as you can uh, hear. Uh, now I will go for a last round of uh, intervention from the panelists. Uh, and after that, we will take the question from the audience. So I will go back to, um, to Christina. Uh, and I would uh, like to ask her about the, the long-term consequences for the company um, and uh, and some may, maybe some uh, key lessons learned and messages as a way of conclusion. Christina, the, the, the floor is yours. Listo. Um, bueno, en términos de las consecuencias, yo creo que todavía hay una gran incertidumbre en términos de lo que eh, del efecto de COVID eh, sobre la empresa, incluso sobre la economía. Eh, que pues ya eh, en Colombia tenemos un nivel de desempleo alrededor de, del 20% y creo que eh, volver a los niveles de antes eh, no va a ser fácil ni, ni tan rápido. Entonces todavía nos, va, nos falta un poco más de información para las consecuencias, pero sí va a ser un retorno más lento de eh, pues probablemente de lo esperado, con un impacto... Eh, pues sobre, digamos, las finanzas de la empresa eh, que esperamos definitivamente poderlo manejar, pero, pero eso va a tener, eh, digamos, unas consecuencias. Eh, ahora, creo que también como organización hemos evolucionado a raíz del COVID y, y, y nos abre de todas maneras eh, una nueva forma de operar eh, y, 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 y que también se puede ver como una oportunidad para tener una mejora en eficiencia eh, que, que como que no habíamos dado el paso eh, antes, por ejemplo, a temas de teletrabajo y de poder operar a distancia que era, 
que antes, digamos, no lo, no lo habíamos eh, considerado o no considerarlo, hacerlo tan rápidamente como nos tocó en términos de días, transformar la forma de cómo lo veníamos haciendo. Eh, yo creo también un poco que eh, en términos de, de las le le lecciones aprendidas, eh, es que cuando todos tenemos un objetivo común y, y, y claro y concreto, eh, el equipo funciona y funciona muy rápidamente eh, para lograr, digamos, los diferentes eh, objetivos. Y ejemplo de eso es poder tener hoy en día ya, um, no sé, 1,700 personas trabajando desde la casa y que todos logremos eh, operar rápidamente y entender que hay ciertas situaciones que son urgentes e importantes y que debemos todos trabajar para eh, resolverlas lo más rápido posible. Entonces, eh, al final, como lo dijeron algunos de mis antecesores, eh, lo que sirve es el trabajo en equipo y, y si hay una meta común, creo que todos eh, trabajamos sobre ella. Y, y como retos grandes, eh, aunque en Bogotá no, no es tan alto el nivel, de, digamos, de conexiones o, o de asentamientos informales que tiene la ciudad, eh, sí definitivamente estas situaciones eh, muestran que, que hay que dar una solución diferente probablemente a la tradicional, pero que, que necesitamos pensar como país eh, qué tipo de soluciones podemos dar eh, porque en situaciones como estas es cuando la gente necesita definitivamente estar conectado y tener acceso a los servicios básicos. Y con eso terminaría. Thank you very much, um, Cristina, for, for these words. And um, I would like to just to, to have also some, some words from... Uh, From Akram Nassar on that, like your main messages, uh, do you share the same conclusion as Christina? Uh, uh, frankly, just I need to, to conclude with that we need to make the update for the risk management methods and the procedure to be as a preventive uh, prayer to the anything happens for a matter or any issues. Uh, you know, also we need to, to be equipped with apparatus and tools Uh, for this infection and uh, to keep always a social distancing among the situation because you know that it is considered as a culture um, and also I, I can see that we need also to do uh, a platform within the local utilities in the in the beginning with the stakeholders uh, I mean a, a health ministry environment ministry and the municipalities To, to, to have uh, a, a good base to, to transfer knowledge in the beginning and then to do um, a comprehensive procedure um, to overcome all these kind of issues. Um, and then to make also a continuous platform uh, to solve and to share the knowledge with uh, other utilities around the world. I think, yes, I conclude here. Okay, thank you. We, we, at GWOPA, we got the message of uh, also continuing our role as APE uh, to do some exchanges between the operators. Uh, I would like also to hear from Mr. Vasquez on, on this, the conclusion, long-term consequences, main messages. Mr. Vasquez? I'm not sure that uh, Mr. Vasquez is still connected. So while he's reconnecting, uh, and he's connected, he's, he was muted. Just give him a second. Sorry, sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I agree that uh, we should really take a look at our teamwork and network with other government agencies. And one thing we'd learned is our emer emergency response plan was really inadequate. We never expected this kind. We must seriously consider really looking at uh, how we are going to construct our office spaces. We also must look into the water source projects for water security for our city. 
that includes NRW, water demand management, and water impoundment. Well, to our city, water is, is a very essential to this fight, especially against this COVID-19. The survival of our company must be ensured. I hope that government will help us. I hope that uh, the regulators will uh, approve our proposed tariff increase because it must reflect the present economic times. A new strategic and business plan must be developed for business continuity and to address future risks. I end my statement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Vasquez. We can have a word also from uh, a month. I think you already delivered most of your conclusion, but maybe you have one last uh, takeaway lesson. Yeah, I, I think that what I'd like to offer is that, you know, that one of the consequences of this virus has been, I'd like to believe, that water utilities have, have come to a realization that we are in the business of public health protection. And we need to do the best we can to, to, to defend the public health of our people through our water. And the other aspect I'd like to quickly highlight is the notion that all of the 1.8 billion people in the world that don't have access to water and the 2.8 billion who do not have access to sanitation the transmission of this virus has been severely compounded given that challenge of water and sanitation. And I'd like to believe that the world will now act even more speedily to overcome that challenge because that is going to create a public health challenge for us ongoing from here into the future if we do not arrest the situation quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Armand, for this. And um, Armando Quazzo, you want also to, to conclude? Yes, yes my, my conclusion on uh, the lessons learned. Uh, first, uh, teamwork. We have uh, uh, being within uh, the uh, Aqua Publica Europea has been a real valuable source of information because the same strategy has been widely adopted and the exchange of experiences have, has proven invaluable same problem need always the same solutions second uh, as, a, as a as a lesson we learned to, to work in a smarter way i mean uh, there has not has not been uh, a devastating to use remote uh, conference devices for boards of directors or for meetings uh, with relevant savings uh, in of time and costs uh, it's something that unions will not like but uh, I'm sure that uh, we, we, we had the proof that uh, the business can run uh, good, in a good way also with, uh, with, uh, with less stuff. But uh, let, me, let me bring uh, uh, the, the wisdom of the ancient Latins that said, civis pacem in parabellum, that means if you want the peace, you have to prepare for the war. And uh, uh, we feel that uh, in this period against the COVID has been a, a, real, a real war. A real war, so we'll have to be to be to be ready for for everything. Uh, the things that we have to implement uh, regarding the, 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 the what happened during the COVID is surely uh, to implement the unmanned operations uh, to enhance the water safety plan, transforming them into emergency plans, and uh, uh, enhance remote meter remote meter reading and uh, uh, online systems, uh, online tests uh, to, to test the water quality. I think that uh, we had a great uh, lesson from, uh, from the COVID and we uh, have to see the silver lining on, on this as well. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, well, as you are saying that actually, I would like maybe to have a quick look at the poll results. Yeah. Okay, so if it has a silver lining with the COVID crisis, what is it? So most, well, 36% of the people think that, uh, as also Professor Kassan said, uh, this crisis could be an opportunity to reprioritize WASH uh, from policymakers and politicians and decisioners. So that could be one of the good, well, let's go. 
positive consequences on the long run. Uh, innovation, I think that was also very uh, clear in all our, your presentations that uh, you, you all have to be innovative, creative to face uh, this uh, unprecedented crisis, uh, turning to less man operation as well, uh, uh, developing more remote meter reading, uh, using more IT solutions, uh, people working from home also. It's a different way of managing the workforce, as you said. Um, and then uh, equal people think that the trust between operators and users uh, has been um, improved, uh, which is also a good, good thing. And new collaboration or more collaboration between uh, utilities and the partners in which uh, organization like APE can play a, a good role. Um, so, well, we you will have uh, all the final results, but I would like now maybe to uh, to have some questions from the audience. Uh, and uh, okay, I, I will stay with uh, Armando, actually, still uh, on the screen. Uh, I think your, what you said about this bacon used by uh, the, the workers has raised a lot of eyebrows. And you also mentioned the, the trade unions, right? So how, is, how are the workers reacting to this? Well, it's uh, very difficult to say how they, they, they reacted because uh, we just imposed it. And uh, uh, we said that uh, it was a, a, a protection unit, a protection device, and therefore they had to adopt it. I saw and also answered into the into the chat uh, of someone who said, uh, "How can you how can you tell from uh, uh, contact between colleagues or contact with other people?" I will never. I, I mean, uh, one of the strengths of the application is that uh, it doesn't make any kind of discrimination. If you come closer to someone else. Uh, closer than one meter, you are traced. Uh, after after a few seconds, uh, your telephone will start to beep and tell you you are too close to someone else. I do not take. I, I do not care uh, if uh, this one is your your colleague. If uh, you are in the bathroom, if you are eating something, or if you are uh, talking about uh, soccer. Well, not soccer because all the stadiums are closed. But uh, uh, it doesn't matter if you come too close. Uh, and uh, uh, if you have, uh, if, uh, if if this uh, goes uh, goes ahead for for some time, you are you are tracked. Um, obviously, uh, the um, the privacy issue has been uh, one of the one of the worst. But uh, uh, I I have to explain that uh, the system identifies numbers. I mean, I have my beacon and my telephone. Uh, Julie Perkins has his own beacon and and uh, and and so and so and so. But uh, I am a number. Julie is a number. Leonardo Vasquez is a number. If two of these numbers come in contact, uh, there is uh, no um, no reaction. Only in the case that uh, Armando Quazzo, that number becomes infected, uh, I have the mean to inform Julie Perkins and Leonardo that uh, we have been together and we have become in contact in less than one meter uh, for let's say three minutes, four minutes. So uh, warning, uh, and so we we overcome the problem of. Uh, um, uh, of privacy through this through this system. I mean, privacy is important to be maintained, but uh, uh, safety is even even more important. Okay, th thank you, Armando. I will come back to you after, just after this question. But I will ask also to Milo, uh, who is still with us, who was our first uh, panelist. This type of devices, did, is it something that you have seen amongst your other members in Europe? Well, uh, when Armando presented actually this uh, uh, device in another webinar that we organized ourselves among other European utilities, more or less the same questions were raised to Armando as today. Uh, to my understanding and to my knowledge, uh, so far, um, let's say the SMAT uh, is quite advanced on that. And other operators in, in other parts of Europe, not yet, also because in many countries in Europe, they are still uh, waiting for national app uh, to be adopted. So many European countries have been working on adopting this kind of, the same kind of app at national level. So many operators are waiting for the national app. Uh, in the case of SMAT, they, they 
since the technology is easy and more or less available, they decide to, to, to go faster. This is a bit my um, knowledge of the situation in Europe. Okay, thank you, Milo. Um, I will have a question again to Armando and also to uh, Cristina uh, in Bogota. Something was said about uh, wastewater management. Um, I think also some people in the audience uh, needed some clarification. Uh, can, you, can you tell us uh, if you are taking any specific precaution in terms of wastewater management? Uh, is it uh, something, the the, do we find the virus in wastewater and is it a risk for uh, the workers, of course, and then for the population as well? So uh, maybe first Christina and then Armando. Christina? Sure. Um, creo que hay, hay dos temas importantes. Lo primero es que, eh, de acuerdo a los estudios que hemos revisado, Sí vemos que eh, pues sobre eh, el, el alcantarillado eh, puede estar el virus. Entonces, en ese sentido, eh, nuestros trabajadores tienen una protección adicional, eh, los que tienen relación, digamos, con alcantarillado. Nosotros ya iniciamos eh, pruebas de COVID en eh, algunos puntos del alcantarillado, en, en el punto, digamos, de disposición final. Y hasta el momento no, las pruebas no han dado positivas eh, y estamos iniciando un proceso para aumentar el número de pruebas eh, a lo largo, digamos, en diferentes puntos de la ciudad para, como indicadores. Pero todavía las que hemos hecho no han dado resultados eh, de COVID en el alcantarillado, en el punto final. Ok. Thank you. And uh, Armando, do, is it the well, same for you in Turin? Yes, it's close to the same. Uh, uh, first of all, I have to say that I'm not a technician and therefore uh, don't take for granted what I'm saying. But uh, uh, after the treatment of wastewater, uh, we found uh, into, the, uh, into the effluent, uh, not the virus, uh, but the trace of the virus. And uh, you can find the trace of any kind of virus. I mean, components of the virus because uh, we, we make uh, some kind of molecular tests uh, and uh, from the molecular tests uh, you see that uh, uh, there, there, are, there are parts of the virus but not the virus itself. Second issue, uh, the operators that operate on uh, wastewater treatment plants uh, uh, already have a uh, high level of uh, security because they all wear FFP4 masks uh, and therefore uh, I mean that they are already, uh, already uh, on, on the safe side uh, for, for, for this. Um, third, third point, uh, uh, we didn't find uh, any kind of a positive uh, uh, into, into, into the, uh, the effluent uh, of, uh, uh, of, of the water. So as uh, Professor Kassan said before, uh, this is uh, an, an airborne virus, it's not a waterborne virus. Uh, we must really be careful and not to, to create uh, any kind of, uh, of uh, alert. Anyway, uh, I think uh, um, wastewater uh, treatment as well as sludge will not be the issue of this virus as well as other viruses. Viruses. Uh, by the way, SMAT has a, has a long uh, uh, tradition in, in, in finding virus uh, in effluent water and in drinking water and everything. We have a research center and uh, uh, we, we uh, monitor uh, all of kind of outcomes from uh, the viruses uh, to the metabolites uh, of drugs in order to see how much drug is used in our, in our cities. Yes, yeah, that's true. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Anna, that's Milo speaking. Just yes. um, to complement what just said on wastewater and to share another piece of information. If there are people that are still interested in knowing more about risk uh, related to the virus presence in wastewater, there's been a, a webinar by the WHO on that, where uh, in very interesting and scientific uh, um, information was shared, also approaches coming from national health authorities, which, uh, well, in two words, uh, ensure about the fact that, especially in sludge, there is no risk at all. Uh, in wastewater, there is not much risk than for other kind of uh, diseases. But in any case, uh, we can share then in, um, in a workspace, the link to the webinar from the WHO, where all these scientific reports uh, have been provided.
Okay, Th thank you, Milo, for this uh, for for this di for this information. Okay, I just want to warn you that we are very close to the end, but we are going to go a little bit beyond the uh, the time that we were uh, planned. I still want to have maybe a last uh, question. There are some very interesting, very technical questions in the Q and R. And I'm really inviting uh, you to join us on Workplace, that is our platform also, where we will continue posting the questions that have not been responding here. And we will ask the panelists to respond on Workplace. I will maybe ask uh, one last question to uh, Professor Amanf and to uh, Mr. Um, Vasquez about the support from the government. What kind of support you would like have to add or you had from the government, be it uh, financial or also uh, helping utilities to gather to, to get the supplies. Not notably, we, we all had this problem of uh, getting masks for the workers. So, Mr. Vasquez and then uh, uh, Mr. Kassan. Mr. Vasquez? Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, basically, we need the support of the government in transporting the needed materials for the repairs. No? Uh, from Manila to our country, that's quite far. And uh, we need the approval of, for tariff increase because, and this will really help us financially. And with that, we really, we really can, you know, uh, do our work as regards to providing water and uh, repair services to our community. In that way, uh, we'll be assured of our continued services. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And uh, Mr. Kassan, do you want to say something about that also? They were Certainly. To you Thanks. also yeah. the cash flow management and how you are going to break even. Mm -hmm. Sure. Thank you for the opportunity. On the first issue, which is the support from the government, yes, we, we have been uh, positively predisposed in terms of support from the government, not in terms of money, because we are an independent public utility. We report to the government, but we do not receive ever any funding from government. However, there is a different uh, experience we have this time. We are supporting the government in being an implementing agent for rolling out water services nationally under this emergency. So in fact, the government has taken the view that they would use their water utilities as implementing agents to help them in order to overcome the water challenge in South Africa. On the matter of the uh, cash flow, yes, the cash flow and liquidity challenges, what strategies have we used there? Essentially, you know, to give you the short answer, we reprioritize the budget. In the face of this pandemic, we reviewed the entire budget and asked ourselves a simple question. What scope of work would still be occurring this financial year and what is unlikely to occur and how can we reprioritize and reorganize funds so that we do not have a liquidity or cash flow challenge or have sufficient funds in order to buy all the PPE that we need for our staff, etc. So essentially that is how we did it. There was a last question on, on the water treatment systems and you know, are they really well adapted to face some of the micro nano particles that, that, that are now coming to be in terms of technological advances and emerging contaminants, et cetera. How do we improve these water treatment technologies and systems? Well, the rate at which science is now progressing and the level at which we can measure, it's infinitely small compared to what we dreamt we could measure in water. So we will need more sophisticated technologies for water treatment, yes. However, at the same time, Whilst the conventional systems still work if you operate them properly, the, the, the important lesson is we must operate the systems efficiently, not necessarily always change the technologies. The second thing is that whilst these technologies are emerging in order for us to measure all of these different chemicals, let us also be conscious that where are the source of these chemical compounds coming from? And at what stage will we change technology or will we really rethink innovation and the number of chemicals that we use? I think we have to approach this problem from both sides because the number of 
chemicals that are coming out that are being produced. For example, let's go back to the wastewater issue we were referring to. It's well established in the world that you will find the RNA fingerprint of the virus in the wastewater. You don't know that it's viable, but you'll find the fingerprint. And that will tell you the quantum of, the, of the, 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 the cases in a community. Similarly, if you look for HIV AIDS, you will also find that. If you look for pharmaceutical compounds, you will also find that in the wastewater. So I guess the short answer that I'm offering is that we ought to be careful what compounds we innovate in the future, but we also ought to be very careful that we do not pollute the resources because this is gonna create major challenges downstream to change our water treatment technology at additional cost, and that cost burden will be for the consumer. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Thank you for the detailed uh, response. Okay, I think we need to stop here. Um, so just a few words in conclusion, and then I will leave the floor to Jolly Perkins for the next step. Thank you very much to all the panelists, to our co-host APE to uh, have participated, to the audience. Uh, we will have some information about the audience after that. Uh, thank you all for connecting, for your intervention. Please uh, remember that you can, we can continue the dialogue on workplace, and I think there are many other questions that uh, we wanted to ask, but the time is uh, too short. Uh, I want also to celebrate here really the responses from, the diff from all the operators uh, that have presented uh, today their, their, their emergency plans and what they have done and how quick they, they have been to react, uh, even with diverse uh, degrees of preparation and di diverse uh, degrees of complexity of their responses. But, um, we, we want really to celebrate uh, the, those operators that are providing an essential service. Uh, and we want also to, to highlight again that the solidarity, the exchange between peers, as we did here, uh, is really also key in terms of uh, overcoming the new challenges and the new normal that is coming for us. So thank you all, audience, interpreters, the GWOPAS team too, and now Julie will uh, wrap up. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. And this was really very interesting. Thank you so much. I think I'm sure that the audience um, was also very engaged and found found this very, very useful. Um, it also gives us a lot of good messages going forward in um, in, in our efforts to help utilities share with one another um, the different events and activities that we have um, coming forward. Um, you know, there are many. This is obviously raising many further questions that need to be looked at uh, in greater detail. Um, we talked about wastewater in particular, wastewater and sanitation, and even the potential for using wastewater um, for monitoring the presence of, of the disease um, before its cases are, are known is something that we, we want to look into. And the next webinar that we have planned in two weeks' time, um, we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, in addition to the, the different um, resources that we're going to share in Workplace, Obviously, these questions around liquidity and moving forward, the recovery, this is, this is like it's raising many, many uncertainties um, and challenges. And I think it's really a moment for, um, for us to share different ideas. Milo mentioned um, some work that they were doing, looking at new approaches there. There's, there's really a need to be discussing um, how we overcome that serious question of, of cash flow uh, in the future, supply chain management. All of these things we're noting down as things that we want to um, to, to the need to be addressed. I also think there's really great, a lot of novel experiences and lessons learned for the recovery um, that we can really build on as well. Um, many, many good experiences that are documented, for example, in this, uh, in this, doc, in this uh, publication that we're um, about to put out with the APE, but many other, other ideas as well. And I hope that they, um, we can learn more from you on those things around, around new uh, collaborations that have happened, new relationships, strengthened relationships with your customers, um, how, how we're working better with digital communication. This is for within our own utility, but also in, for peer exchanges, how we, can, how we can support one another more effectively remotely. Um, and then of course, these really big, big questions around climate water security and how we can build on, on our strength and um, emergency response and think longer term for building stronger resilience. And all of these things are really, uh, I, think, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of material coming to light here that we can, we can work with. Moving to our, our next steps, 
Um, if, if Craig, you could show the slide where we have the different things that uh, GWAPA is working on. Um, uh, we have an, a campaign uh, presently, um, Utilities Fight COVID, uh, that is um, where we're collecting stories, experiences from around the world. Many of you have contributed to this. You can go, you can see what others are doing um, in, in response. Um, we welcome you to share share things here. This is a, mainly a social media campaign, but there are a lot of a lot of links as well. Um, the webinar series, as I've mentioned, we've we've had a couple of webinars already. There was a one sharing German experience in particular, uh, slums uh, two weeks ago. Today we're focusing on this one: sanitation, wastewater to come up. Something fo more focused around the questions of of, um, of service continuity and and the sort of financial uh, challenges that this has raised. Um, and we look forward also to your inputs about what you need to hear about, what you'd like to hear about, what you'd like to exchange on and share with others as well. And then finally, in our in our workplace, uh, we've mentioned at the beginning, and you may know about it. It's a it's a platform where we're carrying on the exchange. We're trying to um, you know continue this discussion, but it's also a spot where people can share um, their 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 own experiences, questions, documents. Um, for example, uh, we have just posted something um, shared from GIZ. It's not a, a final GIZ document, but it's something that's come up from their field staff. It's called a utility um, COVID-19 checklist. And it's a very useful tool that can be used right away for utilities just making sure that they're a starting point for moving forward and ensuring that they're, they're responding in, in, a, in a comprehensive way to, this, uh, to, the, to the new, to the new um, challenges that they're facing. That's all I want to say. Anne already said thanks, but I would like to say thanks also to Anne Bousquet and all of you panelists. Uh, very, very much appreciated. Aqua Publica Europea and all our other partners, the translators, and particularly the GWAPA team who's made this almost seamless behind the scenes, um, transitioning from slide to slide. Thank you very much. And we hope to see you um, next, next uh, webinar in two weeks' time. Bye bye. <laughs>